neutrinos are a very tiny particle. They're, they're neutral. They have an intrinsic spin. And they're very interesting particles. They come, neutrinos are left-handed, and antineutrinos, the antiparticle of the neutrino, are right-handed. And they have a very, very small mass, something which has not actually been directly measured, but nevertheless very known to be very small. So when you take a beam of neutrinos and smash have it smash against nucleons, which are constituents of nuclei that make up atoms, an interaction happens which is called the weak interaction. And the weak interaction has very interesting symmetry properties. Um, by studying the nature of the neutrino nucleon scattering, and for example, measuring the angles of the debris that comes out from this scattering, you can study properties of the weak interaction. There are two kinds of particles that are exchanged in that interaction. When a neutrino interacts with a, a nucleon, that is either a proton or a neutron, it exchanges what is called a heavy gauge boson. It's either called a Z boson, Z for zero charge, neutral, or a charged particle, which is called a W boson. The W bosons, since they're charged, um, form what's called the charge current interaction because charge is involved in the interaction of the neutrino with the proton or neutron. Whereas when the neutrino interacts and exchanges this neutral Z boson, that's called the neutral current because there is no charge involved. So by, for example, studying the ratio of how often a neutrino interacts by exchanging a Z boson versus how often it interacts by exchanging a W boson, you can measure uh, many fundamental quantities. But one thing which is very, very, uh, has been a long stream, stream of research over the last um, 20 or 30 years for studying the standard model, you measure what's called a weak mixing angle, the so-called Weinberg angle. And that weak mix mixing angle tells you the strength of the neutral current interaction versus the strength of the charge current interaction. By measuring that weak angle and then using other, other information, you can then make predictions about what other particles might exist. So for example, um, in neutrino scattering way back in the early 1980s, the weak neutral current was, actually it was in the late 70s, the weak neutral current was first discovered. And by measuring the Weinberg angle, uh, this then led to a prediction of another particle that might exist, and that's the top quark, etc. Anyway, by studying these two different interactions um, and measuring their relative strength, one can then use what are called radiative corrections, which are computations of, of higher order interactions where the Ws and the and the Z bosons interact with neutrinos and with quarks inside the nucleon. Um, by studying these higher order corrections, you can then make a prediction about another particle. And that other particle happened to be the top quark. And the top quark was something which was not observed until experiments were done at Fermilab and outside of Chicago, where protons collided with antiprotons with sufficient energy to actually directly produce the top quark. But the interesting story is that neutrino scattering prior to the direct uh, detection of the top quark actually predicted that the top quark would exist. And, the top, and he even made a prediction about what the top quark mass would be. And so there's, there's this um, long string of experiments that start at lower energy. Um, you measure things, you look at relations between different interactions, you can measure different key parameters of the theory. And then using the theory itself, 
and these things which are called radiative corrections, these higher order interactions, you can then make a prediction about the existence of other things. And that was the really a very nice, beautiful piece of physics. So neutrino scattering made a prediction about what the mass of the top quark would be. And it was supposed to be about 175 times the mass of the proton, so a very heavy particle. But it took a lot of development of experimental technique and accelerators um, to produce the, this very massive particle because you need a lot of energy e equals mc squared in order to produce this large, large mass particle. So the experiments at Fermilab actually found the top quark and that was an experimental coup. It was a marvelous thing. But where was its mass? It was about 175 GeV, which was predicted from the earlier neutrino experiments. So I think that that was one of the, one of the marvelous connections with theory. The particular experiment that I worked on was um, at Fermilab. It was a neutrino experiment. It was um, a fine grain calorimeter, which um, sampled the reaction products of the neutrino nucleon, or more fundamentally, the neutrino quark scattering in a very, very fine grain way. So, for example, when a neutrino comes in and interacts either by exchanging a W, which as I said was the charge current interaction, or exchanging a, a neutral particle, a Z, um, you can then look at the debris of the interaction in the apparatus. And the apparatus that we built was very, very fine-grained, so you could see lots of details about the interaction. So we could study the characteristics of each interaction individually, which was a, a marvelous thing. And we were able to separate the neutral current from the charge current. We measured sine squared theta Weinberg, which was one of the contributions uh, that went into the determination through radiative corrections to the mass at the top. So it was an interesting experiment. It was, um, we, we measured a lot of different things, but I think the most interesting part of it was this theoretical chain that I talked about, namely to measure uh, the Weinberg angle and then use that for subsequent radiative corrections to make predictions of what uh, the rest of the theory would be. So an experiment in this case had predictive power. It's usually the, the theorist of course, have predictive power. They invent theories and predict that the existence of something would be there, but the experiments actually showed where it would be. And that is, I think, a very nice thing of a collaboration between experiment and theory. Well, there are many unanswered questions still in neutrino uh, physics. One of them is to determine all of the neutrino um, mixing parameters. Actually, neutrinos come in three different flavors. I was involved in a very early experiment to, to try to see how one kind of neutrino changes into another kind of neutrino. But subsequent measurements, in fact many, um, done here by faculty at MIT, um, have measured neutrino uh, mixing or neutrino oscillations as it's called. And this was something that was predicted by Bruno Pontecarvo, who was a very interesting physicist. He um, predicted um, a long time ago, it was in the 30s or early 40s, that neutrinos could oscillate into other kinds of neutrinos. So for example, there's a kind of neutrino which is associated with an electron which is, of course, the electron is the, the, the particle that make up atoms along with the proton and neutron that make up the atomic nucleus. So he predicted that it is possible that an electron neutrino could oscillate and change its, its skin, so to speak, into another kind of neutrino. And that prediction was made a long, long time ago, and it was a marvelous thing. People had searched for it and searched for it and searched for it, never found it, but then over the last 20 years or so, neutrino oscillations were really found. This particular discovery has opened up a whole new range of experimentation, and it's something I think that, um, you know, it's an exploration, a very active field of exploration that's going on now in neutrino physics.
Well, there are many problems in uh, doing neutrino physics. The fundamental problem is the fact that neutrinos do not like to interact with anything. They will go through the sun, they will go through the earth, they will go through uh, light years of lead. Um, and so in order to do experimentation with neutrinos, you need a, to have huge numbers of neutrinos and very, very large experiments. So you have, it's basically brute force. You have, you create a beam with many, many neutrinos and then you build a very massive detector. It's measured in tens of tons or hundreds of tons or even kilotons. So um, with all of that, then you get a few neutrino interactions. And so it's a very difficult experiment, and I think that that's really the fundamental impediment. Otherwise, people would end up doing lots of tabletop neutrino experiments, but that doesn't exist. That's not available. There are various future directions going on in neutrino physics. Um, some actually are under, on going on at, at Fermilab, and there are two major experiments that are under construction now at Fermilab. This is the laboratory outside of Chicago. Um, and these experiments involve producing a very intense neutrino beam and then allowing it to go for a very long distance. One neutrino beam goes all the way, all the way to uh, South Dakota. Another neutrino beam goes all the way from a suburb of, um, of Chicago to Minnesota. And in Minnesota and in Colorado, there are other detectors that will detect the neutrinos. And so the neutrino burrows through the Earth, essentially unattenuated, and then a very, very small fraction of them uh, interact with the far detector. So you get, you build a massive far detector, that is the detector in Minnesota or the detector in Colorado, um, and you get, um, the, the experiment is to produce, make that detector so big that you get a significant number of neutrinos so that you can study its interactions. And one of the things that people are now looking for is whether or not um, neutrinos violate a symmetry in physics. And that symmetry in physics is called charge uh, conjugation parity, other words, CP. So it means that when you change a neutrino to an antineutrino, um, there are various symmetries um, that if the neutrino is CP even, the neutrino uh, will have a certain properties. On the other hand, if there's a small violation of this symmetry, the so-called CP symmetry, then you will see evidence of that in these experiments. And I think that's the long-term goal of these experiments. It's, it's fundamental. Neutrinos are fundamental particles. They're wonderful because a lot of other kinds of particles that we have in every day, for example, protons, are not fundamental. Uh, because they're composed of quarks and gluons, but neutrinos, electrons, heavy electrons, um, particles of light, all of these are fundamental particles and that's why they're so much fun to study. <laughs> <laughs>